Okay, good evening in lockdown land. You can tell we've been locked down for too long in the UK. I'm ready for another haircut. Um, tonight we're looking at machines because people have been posting some very expensive machines and one of the problems I find is that people somehow think by spending money on machines they're doing themselves, their children, their spouses, whoever a favour and you can spend a lot of money for something that is not used and so we thought we would talk about the sorts of machines that people are buying We've done a PowerPoint, which Marnie's going to organize. And um, then we will talk. There's a couple of pieces of equipment I've missed off it. So I'm sure that you will all jump and tell me that I've missed off a piece you're interested in, but I will certainly add one or two along the way. Okay, Marnie, can we put up the PowerPoint? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the PowerPoint and then take questions. So it's probably going to be about 40 minutes of PowerPoint and then all the rest will be questions and discussion. OK, are we sharing? Because I can't see it. You're on mute, Marnie. <laughs> the phrase of lockdown. The phrase of lockdown. It's just opening it, it closed itself. Okie doke. <laughs> Come on. I think Office have updated itself on my laptop. Oh yes, mine, mine asked about updating mine and I said tonight so that it didn't interfere with me trying to make this PowerPoint. So the PowerPoint will be available on obviously with the rest of the webinar. So you don't have to make notes or anything. You don't have to worry that you won't be able to see it. There's no pictures that you can't copy or take from. So the PowerPoint is just stuff that you will find on the internet uh, generally. So um, there's nothing in there. This is, as always, these webinars are my experience, and my opinion. This is not gospel. You don't like what I say, go and look something up. You don't have to listen. Um, I have taken information from websites myself, but I also have taken information from as other physiotherapists. So it's not just me. I have asked about some of these machines from other people. It's I, I don't know. Oh, here we go. Finally. Honestly. Right. Um, so if I... No, I don't want that. Right. Share screen. Okay, so here we go. This basically is what it's about, machines and equipment. As I say, I haven't covered absolutely everything. We can discuss other things and I can certainly, I've got my little pad and my pen, so I will write down any other information people want as we go. Okay, so let's start with um, basics. What equipment? So these are questions you should be asking before you buy anything. What are your aims and goals for this piece of equipment? It's no good just uh, thinking, oh, I like the look of that, or oh, can that help me? Remember, SMA is quite rare. Everybody is different. You are not necessarily going to be the same as the next person. So what works for somebody else is not necessarily going to work for you or your child. Why are you looking at this piece of equipment? Uh, does it fit in with the aims and goals that you want? Who recommended it? Was it another parent, another person with SMA? And as I say, no two people are the same. If you have taken a recommendation from another parent, another person with SMA, another spouse of somebody with SMA, make sure that what they wanted from the equipment is the same that you wanted from it. What do you need to know about this equipment? You know, apart from the cost, 
Are you going to have to use it regularly? Are there ongoing costs? How are you going to monitor whether it's actually doing you any good? Uh, can it do you any harm? There are many things you need to know and be sure in your own mind before you put any money out there. Um, can you try it? Uh, most companies will let you try pieces of equipment, but if they are made specifically for you or your child, like a lot of the robotics, you can't strictly try it first because it is built for you so that you have to accept that you're going to have to pay for it, whether it works or not. And the one thing I find a lot about equipment coming up on these pages is the question often from parents, but not only from parents, of the question is, will it work? Will what work? Will it do what? And this is a question that I'm asked quite frequently. Will this piece of equipment work? Will it make your hair turn green? Will it make an arm drop off? You know, if you want to ask me if something's gonna work, you're gonna to have to be specific about what you think that piece of equipment can do. Okay, next slide. Right beware and be wary think about what you want to achieve before you buy it don't just think will this treat my child will this treat me can i make use of this in what way have you taken professional advice don't just listen to companies don't listen to other people have you done your research is there any medical evidence? You may not believe the medical evidence. You know, you may be one of these who would prefer to look on Facebook and Wikipedia and everywhere else. That's up to you, but it's your money, remember, not Wikipedia's or anyone else. How, if you are one of these people who do that, does lots and lots of research, how good is the research? It may be just anecdotal evidence. It may be a one-off piece of information and how recent is the research was it more than 10 years old because if it's more than 10 years old the question is is it actually still relevant today now there was a, a site called pubmed which was uh free to everyone but they've actually started making it quite difficult to access so a lot of the articles that you'll find on pubmed you can find on something called google scholar which you may not have known about so you can find a lot of the same sort of research on google scholar will give you medical articles it might not give you the whole article but it'll certainly give you an abstract when we're talking about cost is the cost reasonable uh, the big thing about cost is you should not ever feel obliged to pay out lots and lots of money. Just because somebody else can afford big sums of money for something does not mean you have to. It doesn't make you a worse parent. It doesn't make you less motivated. It doesn't make you a worse person. It basically just means you have not prioritized that piece of equipment from your budget. And that is perfectly acceptable. Now, the other thing you need to know is that since lockdown, so that's a year almost, in fact, it's 11 months this weekend, um, Amazon have doubled and trebled their prices for exercise equipment. So do beware. Amazon have gone ridiculous and you need to shop around. Don't just say, oh, I can get that on Amazon. Amazon are cheap. They are actually quite expensive for some things and have gone a bit ridiculous. Look at Argos, look at Decathlon if it's sports equipment. Go to the manufacturer or the importer or the distributor in this country and see where you can get it cheaper. Who is recommending it? Can you get information from others who've tried it? Um, you know, it's no good just hearing one parent saying, oh, it was fantastic, or one person said, it really worked for me or my child. What about the people it didn't work for? What did they not like about it? Um, what was it about the machine they didn't get on with? And a good company would tell you exactly the downsides as well as the, the upsides, because they don't want you then saying oh it was awful it didn't work for me it didn't work for my child next slide okay so these are the um this is what we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at pain management using tens massage equipment swelling reduction because that's what a lot of massage is about 
something called intermittent compression therapy, PEMF, which one parent asked me about, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. If you are geriatric like me and a physiotherapist to boot, you will know that we used to call it shortwave. We used to have that. I qualified nearly 43 years ago. I am seriously old and we learned shortwave. And it seriously went out of fashion in favor of ultrasound and lots of other treatments. And it seems it's coming back and we will discuss about it. We will look about at vibration and vibration plates. We will look at FES, functional electrical stimulation, also called EMS, electrical muscle stimulation. We will look at the equipment that you can buy for exercise and activity, walking, bracing and robotics and the upper limb and the hand. Okay, next slide. Oh, what's my next slide? It's gone. What have we got next? Okay. Apart from the cost, what you have to think is no machine is going to cure contractures. So don't think that suddenly it's going to make you or your child straight. No machine is suddenly going to straighten their scoliosis. Yes, exercise may help straighten them up a little bit, but nothing is going to make them straight completely and it's not going to stay straight forever. How are you going to judge what benefit you are getting from the machine? How are you going to assess where you start? And probably the best thing that you can do is decide your aims or your goals, what you want to achieve and get someone or yourself to video what you're able to do at your baseline. Look at some of the assessments we have talked about, particularly the upper limb assessment, if it's upper limb. It may be that you look at muscle power. We've talked about looking at muscle power. It may be that if you are struggling to walk, you may want to uh, look at speed tests, how easy it is to get up from a chair. There's plenty of things that you can look at. If you don't really know how to evaluate yourself, just PM me. And how close are you to achieving your goal with the machine or actually is it something achievable without the machine? Is is the goal you want, do you really need this machine to do it? And then how long do you have to use it? How many sessions, how many times a day, how many hours a day, how many days, how many months? Is it something if I stop using it, then the effect's all going to disappear? So you have to think, if you're spending the money, is it going to be long-term worth it? Or do you not mind as long as it cures the problem that you've been talking about? Okay, how much, how often? Next slide, Marnie, please. Make sure you know what you need to do before you get the equipment. If it's gonna be every day, can you commit to every day? If it says to do it three times a week, we'll do it seven times a week, make it that much better. Don't forget about the effects of fatigue in SMA. If it's something that really works you hard, you may be better off having a day off the next day and not doing it every day. Do you have the time to commit to it? If it's a bracing system that's gonna take an hour to put on and half an hour to take off on top of the time that you're in it, can you commit that sort of time? Can you do it? Can your child do it? Is it going to be worth it? And do you want to do it? Or more importantly, does your child want to do it? Are you buying a piece of equipment or paying out for something that actually your child has absolutely no interest in? So think in that way as well. Okay, next slide, getting advice. Okay, there is professional advice out there, use it. Um, if you have a physio, an OT, if you see a sports therapist, ask them about it. Have they used it? Can they help you to use it? If you get the equipment, can you, they advise you when once you've got it? It's all very well going on to Google or Wikipedia or even other people on Facebook. They don't have your interest at heart. They have their own interest. It worked for me. Doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Nobody on Google is going to guarantee you anything. Nobody on Wikipedia will say it's right for you or your situation. And the absolute maxim you should always go by is free advice may only be worth what you pay for it. Next slide, Marnie, please. Okay, so apart from anything we have to think about 
where these machines are going, because we know that the biggest problem in SMA is weakness, and it is the machine going to work on the weakness. If you're having treatment, it may be that what you really need is a machine to help you, to stimulate you. You're on eucinosin, you're on Ristiplam, your child's had Zolgensma. You may well want to get a machine. If you know you are going to get Ristiplam, you may well want a machine but also think about what else is a problem. If you are very contracted, being stronger won't necessarily help you reach your goals. Next slide, Marnie, please. So no machine, even if it helps make you stronger, is gonna cure contractures, asymmetry or scoliosis. It's not gonna cure lack of motivation just by having a machine won't suddenly make you really excited about exercise. If you were never excited about exercise before, let's get real. You're either an exercise person or you're not an exercise person. And I do know that there have been quite a lot of people being quite excited by the idea of having treatments and have become much more motivated and that's great. But if you're not motivated, a machine's not going to make you motivated. Even spending a lot of money might not make you motivated. And you always have to think, can this machine make me worse? Can it actually increase contractures? Because we know it can. Next slide, Marnie. So you've got to look at contractures. You've got to think about whether it's making them worse. You've got to know which contractures are affected. If you getting a machine that's only going to work your upper limbs, it doesn't matter where your legs are contracted. But if your child is going to get a machine that's going to do lots and lots of work on their hip and knee flexors, then yeah, you really need to know what you're doing. Can it make them worse? We have seen children get worse on these machines. So you need to ask, and not only do you need to ask about a machine you may buy? You also need about to ask about machines that private therapists, chiropractors all use with you. You need to know that they know what your problems are. And don't forget hypermobility because you can actually overstretch your joints and cause big problems with hypermobility as well. Okay, next slide. The effect on neck, spine and posture, you have to think that your spine goes all the way from your head all the way down to your bum. It hangs everything on it. Your pelvis is affected by what's going on in your spine, your neck, your head, your shoulders and your arms are all affected. So you have to think about what it's doing for your posture. So when you're in a machine, when you're getting a machine, when your child has a machine, think about how straight or not straight they are. And I've got a lovely picture to illustrate that coming up. Okay, next slide. Okay, set your goals. You need to make yourself some smart goals before you decide on any machine or equipment. You probably all know what smart goals are. They're specific, they're measurable, achievable, relevant to you and your situation. And they have some sort of time limit on them where you can actually measure what you can achieve and when you can achieve it. If you want to achieve something before you start Ristiplam, you have a time goal. If you want to achieve something in the next six months, you have a time goal. If you want to achieve something before surgery, you have a time goal. And it always helps to have a time goal because anybody who's done a diet will know it's much easier to diet if you've got somebody's wedding coming up than if you're just airy fairy and go, well, I must lose some weight. So if there's a goal, if there's a time if there's a something at the end of it it's always much easier next slide okay is it going to if this is a walking machine like the spider cage or some of the other gate trainers don't forget you've got foot posture to look at you've got patterns you've got speed you've got symmetry Will you need orthotics? Will you need extra splints to go with it? Can you do it with splints? Do you have to do it without splints? And is that going to cause a problem? And mobility is not just about walking. There's other types of mobility. Can it help me to roll over? Can it help me to sit up? Will it help with my current lack of mobility? Even if it's just moving around in the wheelchair, being able to lean over to one side to shift my weight or help somebody get my sling in. So there's more to mobility than just being able to walk. Walking is not always the most obvious goal. 
Okay, next slide. We need to think about the machines that can help with pain because obviously pain is an issue for a lot of people and we need to think what that is going to do for pain. And so we'll talk about pain quite a lot, but what we need to look at, and we're gonna start with pain, is muscle pain, which is not a big issue, but certainly you can get pain if you over-exercise or if your muscles are stiff. Joint stiffness, joint deformity can cause pain. You can have back pain from having a very big arch in your back. Pressure sores, which, you shouldn't really get pressure sores are more badly fitting equipment and fractures and micro fractures obviously are painful and there can be other causes of pain. So let's have a look at the equipment that we can get for pain. Okay, so these are some of the things that you can buy for pain. And there are some very, very expensive pieces of equipment out there. Um, you will be horrified by one of the ones that I'm going to show you. But actually you can get inflatable hot tubs for under a thousand pounds. Now I know a lot of UK people and if you're living in Texas right now, you will be saying who wants a hot tub when it's freezing cold outside. But if you have a large wet room, you may even be able to fit an inflatable hot tub in a wet room. It doesn't have to necessarily be outside. There are some fairly small inflatable hot tubs that you could fit into a reasonably large wet room great for pain, great for mobility, and not mildly expensive. And the beauty of having them in a wet room is it makes them much, much easier to fill. So that's one of the nice things. It also makes it a lot easier to empty and you don't get a flooded garden. Now, the next piece of equipment along from the hot tub is something called TENS. And certainly some of the mummies might know about TENS because it's something that they give you for pregnancy. And basically what TENS is, it's not the same as electrical stimulation and people use them interchangeably. They are totally different. TENS is about putting a very, very small electrical current across the skin to reduce the pain threshold, or it's actually increase the pain threshold to actually deaden the pain sensation to make it much harder for the pain sensation to get through and they use it with this very very small electric current it's very comfortable you can get two channel or four and that's how many pads you're putting on they're not expensive but they're very specific to back pain shoulder pain particularly particular pain you may want to consider if you're sick of taking tablets or if this is something that's chronic and been going on for a long time you may want to consider TENS but again get advice on it it's not expensive but unless you know where you're putting the pads unless you can manage to put the pads yourself or have someone like carer or a spouse you need to think about what you're going to do with a TENS machine. And it's probably not recommended on children under 12. The next little bit of kit is a massage machine. And massage has lots of benefit. And the first one is that it feels nice. It relieves tension in muscles. And one of the places that so many of the SMAs get this tension is here across the neck. Yeah, I'm watching you, Marnie. Um, Right in your trapezius muscles, these muscles down here, and the reason they get tense is that because you sit there holding your head with your muscles or you've got your arms up here, and it's a great way to actually stabilize your head, stabilize your shoulders, is by using these muscles, and they get very overworked all the way. They're great big diamond shape all the way, halfway down your back, lots of knots, lots of tension, and it's a great way to relieve it. You can use it to help your circulation. There are lots of different little massage machines. They're not expensive. Um, if you go to some of the things like Nadex or the Ideal Home Exhibition, everybody wants to plonk a massage machine on you and sell you one. Um, there's some very strange ones. If you go onto the internet, you'll find some very strange looking massage machines. Um, but it, if you are somebody who gets quite a lot of tension and a lot of pain, it's not a bad little investment. Now, this strange thing on the bottom row that looks like she's got something very, very wrong with her legs 
is what we call intermittent compression therapy. And basically they pump and they inflate and deflate and inflate and deflate and they act as a pump. And for painful cold feet, for a lot of swelling, you may find that a piece of equipment like this, if you get quite a lot of pain and crampy feelings, cold feet, purpley feet, swollen feet, if it's really quite bad and it would have to be relatively severe, you can use this intermittent compression therapy. And in fact, in the UK, your GP can supply it for you. So you don't have to go out and buy this. But you're gonna to have to find somebody who is prepared to support your application, like a physiotherapist or somebody who will support this. Very few GPs will have a lot of information on this sort of um, equipment. Some of the nurses might, some of the clinical nurse specialists would be aware of it. Um, and it is something, as I say, you can get through your GP if you have very bad circulation problems. And of course, the last thing is a foot spa, which is great for getting rid of swelling in your feet as well and a nice way of doing it. And then some nice person might come along and give you a pedicure afterwards, which would be even nicer. Okay. Next slide. Now, this was, um, I'll show you some pictures of this one. This was a question that I got off um, the list of questions. Do I think this beamer therapy would be good for an SMA type one? Now, beamer therapy, this is this pulsed electromagnetic field known as shortwave. Now, it may be helpful for pain, swelling, post-operative pain. They are very expensive. They're probably more relevant to private therapy practices. It's back to that question. Do you think this would be good for an SMA 186? Good for what? What are you trying to achieve with a machine that basically is working on pain, swelling, post-op pain? So you need to do your research. It's no good just asking, would this work? So let's just quickly whiz through the next three slides, Marnie, because they're bits of equipment. This is the Beamer mat. Um, if you look at the price, you can see it's over $4,000. Um, it gives you a lot of all sorts of strange things like infrared, negative ions, red light therapy, crystal therapy, all sorts of things that you don't want to hear about. Um, next one is a similar piece of equipment, a little bit less expensive, only a thousand dollars. That's a mat um, and it has all sorts of things that it can do. And then the last one looks as though it's professional um, and that one's a little bit less again. It, these things really need to be used by a professional. These are not the sort of pieces of equipment you want to go out and buy. And the other thing is they they are not really recommended on children. I wouldn't use any of this equipment on children, to be honest. It's not something I would, uh, certainly I wouldn't try it on a six-year-old. Uh, most equipment they would recommend for 12 and above. Not something I would be very happy to try. Okay, next slide. Vibration. Now, somebody mentioned Galileo and how expensive it is. And there are lots of things that are not very expensive. Why are we using vibration therapy? Some people will say it's better for your bone health, but actually um, the problem is knowing how long you're supposed to be on it. How are you supposed to be on it? Are you supposed to be standing on it? Is sitting on it okay? Are you supposed to be lying on it? Or are you going to use it for exercise? Again, you can have it for sitting, you can have it for standing. Think about the positions that you are going to use it in. If you are completely wheelchair dependent and quite contracted, how are you going to use a piece of equipment like this? Just sticking your feet on it may no be, not be any better than just having a foot spa. So again, you need to be aware that you can spend not a lot of money on these. Um, as you can see from the prices on here, less than, well, under 200 pounds. But you've got to be aware of what you can do on it. It's got to be very, very adjustable. You've got to be able to um, allow the patterns. 
if you never use vibration therapy, you can have it on constant, you can have different pulse widths, you can have build up and drop, you can have a sort of slow wave, which is an up and down and up and down. So you need to be aware of how it's going to work. And again, you may want to get professional advice before you just go and sort of shake yourself to pieces. Quite an interesting thing to do. I have exercised on it. I personally didn't find it was any better than doing exercise without it, but there are people who really do think it works. Make sure it's one that's versatile. You can see on the first picture on what is my left, but I don't know if it looks like the right to everybody else. There are arm exercises that you can do at that one, Marnie, yeah. And several of them do have arm um, cords that you can attach. The other thing is some of them have standing frames so that you can hold on if you're trying to stand on them, uh, but those do make it quite a lot more expensive. So you may well just find that if you've got something that you can place it beside where you can stand or sit to make yourself safe, if you're not safe in standing, please don't use it. It's You could use it in kneeling, you could use it in sitting, but if you're not safe in standing. Now, the other question is, should you put it on the base of a standing frame? Uh, you possibly could if your child can tolerate it, but make sure the vibration is very gentle to start with and build up. Do not go straight into whacking it on because they won't love you. You need to build up and build up fairly slowly. Next slide. Electrical stimulation, what is it? So it's called functionally electrical stimulation. And this is where I got um, some help from a colleague who is very into electrical stimulation. We do know it works. It basically takes over the role of the duff nerves in SMA and goes straight to the muscle and stimulates the muscle. So if your nerves are not generating enough uh, signal to the muscle, then you can bypass it using functional electrical stimulation. And the EMS unit at the top, which you can buy, which isn't an awful lot of money, um, is an easier one to use. The lower one, this one from PhysioShop, again, it's not a ridiculous amount of money, but as Rebecca has said, it's harder to use and you really do need a professional to help you. Now, unlike TENS where you just bung it on and hope that you get some pain relief, with electrical stimulation, you have to know where you want the, the pads. Again, uh, four channel is better than two. In other words, four pads rather than two pads but there are specific points on the muscle where it works and where it doesn't work. And you need to be getting the right muscle. If you wanna get biceps, it's no point in strengthening brachioradialis because you put the pads in the wrong place. If you wanna pull your foot up, it's no point in twisting it in because you put your foot in the wrong place. And there's no point in trying to pull your wrist up if all you're ending up with is just getting your fingers up. So you have to know exactly where your muscle belly is and get it in the right place on the muscle belly. So if you're gonna do it, that's absolutely fine. It does work. You have to work with it, which was one of the questions. Do you let it work passively? Absolutely not. You've got to work with it. The idea being is that you work with it and then you try and work without it switched on. And that's how you get what we call carryover. That's how you make the machine work is by using it and then stopping and you taking over and the muscle working. But you may well need help with it. Don't just go out and buy one and hope that you will end up managing to get your muscles stronger, but it can be worked. Now, somebody asked, next slide, Marnie, please. Somebody asked and they said they were the parent of a CMT. So I'm not sure why they were asking on this group about this particular machine this is a professional's machine this is most definitely for sports and therapy professionals I wouldn't go out and buy this machine it's ridiculously expensive and very definitely not what Joe Public should be buying um, but with CMT I wouldn't use electrical stimulation because unlike um SMA, where the nerve is viable, but just not sending enough signal down in CMT, the peripheral nerve is actually damaged and the muscle cannot take over. 
because it's getting no stimulation at all. Uh, and all you can end up doing is either causing an unpleasant sensation, which a couple of uh, CMTs I know have had, or actually just strengthening those muscles where there is innovation. So I'm not sure if that mum with CMT, actually it was CMT, but I personally wouldn't recommend using electrical stimulation in CMT, not in most forms of pediatric CMT anyway. Next slide. Okay, exercise and activity. Uh, I know a lot of people are using the inner walk. I have spoken to the inner walk people lots of times. I've seen their videos when it was uh, 30,000 pounds. I really wasn't impressed. Uh, I thought it was an awful lot of money for something that was quite passive. And I have actually worked with one young lady who was using it regularly. We muscle tested her before she used it for three months. We muscle tested her afterwards and she had not gained any power. It can be very passive. It can be doing all the work for you. Ideally, you would be working with it. So you should be doing some of the work. Again, we need to make sure and it needs to be regularly monitored by a physio. Don't believe that the inner walk people are going to do all the reviewing themselves, that they, you are not developing increased contractures. And there was a question whether these machines can be used with AFOs and people said no. Well, the answer is yes, you can use them with AFOs because you should actually be using your knees anyway. So if you're using your knees, yes, you can use them with AFOs. It may be harder to keep your feet on and you might have to find a way of doing it with a sock on the outside or an elastic strap, um, tie a piece of TheraBand over it, whatever you wanna to do to keep your foot on, but there is no reason why you shouldn't use AFOs when you're on the machines. And my honest feeling is about the motorized exercise bikes, the ones that can be used with both hands and feet are to me some of the better machines because there's no reason why you shouldn't be do hand shouldn't be doing hand cycling as well as foot cycling. You need a machine that you can alter. Obviously, speed is related to how you do, but with every piece of machinery, you have to be able to increase the amount of resistance so that you're working harder at times. Or you may be able to program some of the machines so that they give you a little bit of hard resistance. You know, it's like some of these machines where you get the uphill and the downhill. So in effect, what you're using is a treadmill and an exercise bike, because that's in effect what they are. Well, it's actually more of a step exerciser and an exercise bike, but you can use treadmills I have seen quite a lot of people on treadmills in standing slings. And that's another thing that's worth investing in. If you don't invest in anything else, a standing sling is a great way to exercise. You can stick yourself in a standing sling, hoist yourself up. You can kick footballs. You can do all sorts of nice things. You can do a little bit of walking in standing slings. I know a lot of people who've been doing some walking. You may look a little bit like Spotty Dog from the... Um, wooden tops, but yes, you can do all sorts of things in a standing sling. So actually your first piece of equipment might just be a standing sling for your hoist. What I did miss out in the exercise and activity was the spider cage. Um, I'm not a big fan of the spider cage on the basis that a lot of it um, is used by people who do not understand SMA. And while you can do quite a lot on posture control, but quite a lot on standing control, again, you need to make sure that whoever is working with you with the spider cage understands SMA and does not end up with you uh, just increasing your contractures or your asymmetry. Now, I know that a lot of private therapy, children's therapy, services are using spider cages. People say, oh yeah, they know about SMA, they know about SMA, but I'm not convinced. Please make sure they do know which exercises they should be doing, which muscle groups they should be exercising. Because I've had physios tell me, and these are not often UK physios, tell me that, yeah, they absolutely know, they know, they know, they know, and they're still exercising the wrong muscle groups. So whatever, machines you're using, whether they be ones you want to buy or ones that you're using in private practices, please make sure they're being used appropriately. Next slide. 
This is a much cheaper exercise machine. The peanut costs up to 25 quid and the weights cost between two and five. Some of you may have seen this on the Treat MSMA website. It's not how much you spend, it's the effort you put in that can make all the difference. So if you are working jolly hard with equipment that has cost you less than 30 quid, that's more effective than being passively moved around by a piece of equipment that's cost you 10,000 pounds. So think about cheap and cheerful can be equally effective as expensive. Next slide, we're getting on to the walking machines. I'm nearly finished, I think. Um, we need to look at walking because there is a lot of machines coming out that people are saying, oh, they're wonderful, they're marvelous. I'm not convinced. A lot of them like the inner walk can be very passive. If the child's working actively, fantastic. I have no argument with any child, any adult who is using these machines appropriately. There is benefit to passive movement. Some parents think that by exercising passively, all of a sudden their muscles will spring into action and be active. If you're on treatment, you certainly may get better, but it doesn't mean to say that because you can passively stand on an inner walk in six weeks time, you're gonna get up and start running around. So please make sure that your goals are achievable, that you're not expecting these machines to do things outside the realms of the drug therapies and the prospects that your child has. If they're a weak type two, they're not suddenly gonna start walking. If they're a strong type two or not far off walking, you never know you might get there. But passive has its place, but you're not suddenly gonna start walking. Now, this is a little bit controversial, next slide. I am seriously not impressed with the idea of spending $35,000, which is only 25,000 pounds, on a robotic system, plus you have to add the 700 pounds for the Rift and Gate Trainer because that's not included in the price. When there are plenty of gate trainers around that could be doing the same thing without the robotics. And this machine and many of the other robotics machines, which I will have pictures of, to me are incredibly expensive. They're incredibly time consuming. Um, I'm not convinced that any child is going to suddenly get up and walk out of them. And you can have a gate trainer with CAFOs or AFOs or a million and one other things that cost a lot less money and can be equally effective with the right physio working with you. Next slide. This is a multitude of different gate trainers. What worries me a little bit is that in a couple of pictures, you will see that the kids have got their knees bent, they're up on their toes, their hips are bent, and they're toddling along on these gait trainers in a not very brilliant position. But on the other hand, you have a little girl with a beautiful gait trainer and her cafos, and she has free knee cafos, so she's able to at least bend one knee and you can learn to walk with these things. And you do not need a ton of robotics to make them work. Next slide, walking braces. Now, the one on the left, and you can see it may look symmetrical at the bottom, but it certainly doesn't look symmetrical at the top. That's a swivel walker. This young lady is nicely showing how she uses a swivel walker. I do know that there's a center in the UK that still uses them, but most places don't. Um, they basically work by you swinging your shoulders around and it walks for you. So you're not gonna get up and walk out of this one. The strange rainbow colored thing is called a reciprocating gait orthosis. And basically if you stand on one leg, the other one will kick forwards. We've used these in SMA, but not successfully. They were developed for spina bifida and they still work best with children with good upper limb power. They're not going to get you walking if you weren't walking before. Some of you may have heard of a Dave Hart walker. I couldn't get a picture of it because apparently it is restricted. So I'm not sure why the Dave Hart walker is suddenly restricted, but you can't have pictures of it. But it is a cross between the gait trainer and the RGO. Okay, next one. 
exoskeletons. I have worked in the past with exoskeletons and I am not convinced. My honest feeling is that they are a lot of money and a lot of work for not a lot of results. Next picture. We have some lovely pictures of exoskeletons and the robotics gate trainer comes under the heading of, that's the one in the green machine, uh, comes under the heading of robotics. As you can see, these are not machines that um, are the sort of thing you're just gonna go on the tube with or suddenly find that you've got access to castles and weird schools. Um, the top one on the left is strange. Suddenly all the car manufacturers are getting into this because this is Hyundai. And there's another one made by Honda, which is very bizarre looking. But as you can see, these are not something that you're just going to plonk on and go. Uh, my honest feeling is these new, you know, the James Bond style packs that you can fly with are probably going to be more effective. And I'd personally rather have one of those. And again, another robotics for a child. And is this really what the child wants to be walking around in this sort of piece of equipment? And remember, things can. These are built to the individual. So if you have them built to you, you are going to have to pay for them. So you're going to have to agree to pay for it because no company is going to take you on if they think you're going to decide you don't like it at the end of it. Next one. Okay, a little bit on upper limb and hands. I have been looking forever and ever for hand robotics and have come across this. They go down relatively small. There are children sizes. I haven't seen it in use. I've been in touch with a company. Um, hopefully I will get a chance to see what it does. But as you can see, if you can flex, it will then spring you out again. How much resistance and how strong you have to be at flexing, I don't know because I haven't had the chance to try one yet. But there are a few of these out there. And for those of you who are really concerned about your hand function, it may be something worth trying. But this one looks the least complex of some of the ones I have seen. But there are several um, around. It's just trying to get hold of the companies. Next one, upper limbs. Now, there are a lot of upper limb robotics or a lot of upper limb arms, but they're either table mounted or chair mounted. Um, if you got it on the table, you ain't got it on the chair. And if you put it on the chair, you ain't got it on the table. My honest feeling is from what people have told me that the ones that are mounted on a chair are better than the ones mounted on a table, but then they can't be used in bed. And what a lot of people say is what they want to be able to do is roll over in bed or move around in bed. And we haven't found one yet that can be used in bed. And for wives who want their husbands to help a bit more, you can't put them in a washing up bowl because they're not waterproof. So there are a few things you might be able to unload and load the dishwasher, but you certainly can't do the washing up. And the most common arm worn ones, the ones that are actually an arm, unlike the hand robotics, the arm ones are generally uh, developed for missing limbs as opposed to um, just for arm movement. Okay, this is just the final couple of slides before we get into questions, which I'm sure there's plenty of. Think that, can it make things worse? Can it make asymmetry worse? Is this a piece of equipment that you're using more on one side than the other? Is it just built for one side? Is it causing pain? Is it doing anything to your back or your posture? Your asymmetry would, if it's a child, possibly feed into scoliosis. Is it causing fatigue? Because if it is, you need to modify how much you're using it. Next slide. Just because you've bought it doesn't mean to say it's going to keep working. Don't feel it because you've paid out for it. You've got to keep trying because if it ain't working, it ain't working. And one of the things that you're going to have to know is when to stop, when it's no longer useful or whether it's achieved what it's going to achieve and it's not going to do any more or basically it does, hasn't done the job at all. Next slide. And going out and spending all this money on equipment doesn't actually take away from the fact that if you're not doing the basics, why are you going out and spending money when you could be doing better with, without spending money if you did your stretches, did your exercises and wore your splints. But don't think that you can bypass these basics 
and go to equipment because really the basics are still the basics and you need to be doing them. Last slide. Okay, it's the end of half term and it's back to the homeschooling tomorrow, back to hitting the bottle. Um, and that's the end of this slide presentation. Marnie, do we have any questions? We do. We've got quite a lot of interesting standing slings. Actually, yeah. a few questions on them is one, if you've got quite bad neck control, can they be used safely? Well, it depends on how bad your neck control and how high your standing sling is. If you really do feel that your standing um, is not uh, good, if your head control is not good enough, consider wearing a collar. There is no reason at all why you shouldn't wear a neck collar or neck support just while you're in the standing sling. That is absolutely fine. We do not recommend collars to be used all the time, um, but there are some very basic, simple collars that you could wear just for when you're doing the standing if you feel your head control is not good enough. And that's perfectly fine. There's no reason why not. Okay, and can you still use a standing sling if you have severe hip and knee contractures? Yes, you just have to make sure you're further down to the floor. I mean, you know, there's no point in dangling way up in, in thin air, but you can still kick, you can still move, it still gives you some freedom, it still gets you off your tushy, it still gives you the opportunity to, to swivel and move in a way that the only other place you're going to get this sort of activity is in the water. So sometimes just being able to swing, I mean, just be a kid and swing in the darn thing. Um, but you can play football, you can do all sorts of things with a little bit of freedom. You've got to make sure that your standing sling is good. It's not getting in the way of the arms. Let's get real. You do not want it pulling up your crutch to the point where you think that your bit's going to disappear somewhere up around your ears. So it's got to be comfortable. Padded ones generally are more comfortable. Don't let a company get away with giving you something that really doesn't feel nice when you're standing. Make sure it's a company that works well. There are several sling companies. I'm sure people would highly recommend or tell you to avoid certain companies. I used to recommend Silverly, but they seem to have fallen out with favor with quite a lot of people. And there are other companies around, but certainly um, wouldn't matter if you've got hip and knee flexion contractors. It's one place where you're actually going to be able to work your hip and knees, possibly even trying to straighten them, straighten your hips up for a change. Just let the weight of gravity stretch you. That's another way of just be there and dangle. So, or you could put concrete boots on, that might stretch your contractors a bit. And does it matter if your contractors are, if, are like asymmetrical? Like, no, yeah. no, I not at all. Because basically, you're ideally you're going to be in the sling symmetrically, but if your pelvis is very asymmetrical, you may not. So, you may have to jiggle a little bit to get yourself into the best possible position. Um, can you use a standing sling with a portable hoist um, versus a ceiling tracking hoist? Our physio said no. My son is seven type two. If he's only seven, I would have said yes. Um, but it depends on the size of your hoist, how high it goes. It also depends on the manufacturer's uh, recommendations. I wouldn't listen to your physio. I would go to the manufacturer or the supplier and ask them if it can be used with a standing sling. It's really a case of safety. Is it secure enough? Is it stable enough? More than a height issue, but you need to go to the manufacturer and find out. Okay. Because it's, it's very much a safety issue. Um, okay. Are they available through like OTs and stuff or is it only private that you can get them? What, standing slings? Yeah. Um, you will have to speak to your OT. Some may get them for you um, and some may not. Uh, I have had a mixture where parents have been able to get them and parents who have had to buy them privately. Sometimes I must be honest and say parents who've bought them privately have had nicer ones than the ones supplied by the OTs because often the ones supplied by the OTs are pretty basic. And can they be used like in the water so you get the benefit of 
less gravity whilst you're in the standing. There's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be used in the water as long as they can be dried easily. Um, you don't want something that's going to shrink in the water, but most slings these days will wash. Um, the toilet slings sometimes can be used as standing slings and they're mesh and they're easier. You don't want a really sort of hefty sling that's going to carry a ton of water with you. Um, and then as you'll have to drip dry as you come out to let all the water flood out. So the mesh ones, if you're going to go in water, are by far the better ones. Okay. Um, do you recommend APOs or CAPOs for adults? Um, that, that's a very individual thing. Um, I've had adults in CAFOs, but you've got three problems. Firstly, how contracted are you? Secondly, have you ever used CAFOs? Because most of my adults in CAFOs have used CAFOs as children and continued with them into adulthood. Most of my adults who've used CAFOs have been type threes who've lost ambulation sort of somewhere between 12 and 15, have gone into CAFOs relatively late and have stayed with them as an adult because they like the standing, they like the exercise. It's rare for a type two who's had CAFOs and then gone on to spinal surgery to then go into CAFOs. It's much, much more common that adults in CAFOs are non-ambulant type threes. Um, oh, sorry, AFOs. Well, it depends. If your feet are fixed, they ain't going anywhere, whether you put AFOs on them or not. If you had surgery to your feet, most definitely you will need AFOs unless your feet have been fixed. Now, there's two types of surgery to feet. There's soft tissue surgery, whereby you most definitely do need AFOs because your muscles and tendons can all tighten up again. And with bony surgery, which is where they actually glue everything together or more likely screw everything together and actually reposition your foot and hold it all together with screws. And that's probably not going anywhere. And then you probably don't need AFOs. But again, AFOs are very much the sort of thing that you've grown up with and continue with as an adult because you had them as children. To start suddenly wearing AFOs in adulthood would be extremely rare. I was just going to ask if it's like, use me as an example, I wouldn't wear them once I got to a certain age because I wanted to wear certain shoes. So would it be something feasible to start wearing again? or could It, it be could possibly be, but is it going to change your foot position? Um, if, it, if you have painful feet, it can help. If you have feet that twist but are still mobile, it's only gravity that's twisting them, it can help. But you've got to think, what do you want to achieve with them? Is it achievable? And have you got a company who understand what you're trying to achieve? Yeah. And again, you will need to find someone who will, will um, refer you for them. Should be a GP. But, you know, if you go to a bog standard um, orthotic clinic in a district general hospital, you'll get something off the shelf that is not what you're expecting. It's very rare as an adult to have something tailor-made you will get a bog standard off the shelf you know highly unlikely to be fitted piece of equipment okay do you recommend hk afos for no <laughs> we have a very very strict policy on h cafos at great ormond street um there are countries and there are physios who give them out to everybody I know in Poland, they all get them. Um, I think Chiara Mastella is very keen on them in Italy, but we do not believe that having an H CAFO is necessarily the answer. We would give an H CAFO to a child who we believed would improve to the point of going into CAFOs. So if we felt the child will benefit by having what is in effect a tailor-made standing frame, and then we'll progress enough to go into CAFOs, we will do it. Or even walk out of the H CAFO because they're on an upward trajectory. 
they're having treatment, they're getting better, we feel that this is somewhere positive to go. If the child is on the downward slide, in other words, they've been in CAFOs and they're struggling in CAFOs, no, we won't go to, into an H CAFO. There's no value in it whatsoever. It's not going to improve anything. If the child is struggling in CAFOs, then it's a standing frame. It's not an H CAFO. We will use H CAFOs, but only in a very, very structured way, not for everybody. Okay. Um, what do you move on to? when legs are too tight for orthotics? Do you recommend an inner walk for standing in? No, because an inner walk is an exercise machine. It's not a standing machine. And an inner walk is not going to straighten you up. And it's not, as I say, a static stander. An inner walk is very strictly an exercise machine. And on that basis, um, it would be a waste of time if you were too contracted you're not really going to get very much benefit out of it. We have put a young man very, very recently who was in CAFOs and really struggling but wanted to continue into a standing wheelchair. And that's been very effective. He was 14, 15 years old. He'd stood religiously, type 2 SMA, he'd stood religiously from tiny, but was really beginning to struggle with weight, with contractures, with getting into CAFOs. And so he went into a standing wheelchair. But generally, um, a standing wheelchair, again, is a very, very expensive piece of equipment. If you're not going to use it, don't bother. It's not worth spending £25,000 on a big, heavy piece of equipment that you're not going to use. It really depends whether you can get into a standing frame. Do you want to? Are you going to be comfortable in a standing frame? And why do you want to use it? Why do you want to continue? If you have jolly good reason for wanting to continue, somebody will find a way of doing it with you. But I think a lot of people, when they get to that point, it's not that common to want to continue if you're very contracted because it becomes uncomfortable, to be honest. Standing really does become uncomfortable when there's a lot of pressure on your knees, on your bum, on your feet, and sometimes on your back as well, because if your hips are very contracted, you end up with that very, very lordotic spine, a lot of pressure, hips, knees, and back pain. So really, it's an individual thing as to whether you can achieve it and how you're going to do it when when you're motivated. Okay, um, what equipment do you recommend for kneeling? Uh, hmm, that's an interesting question. In terms of what, getting into kneeling, kneeling against something, because if we're talking about kneeling as in children kneeling, we either use a peanut or a therapy bench. So you, you, we like the adjustable therapy benches. I know several of the parents have got them. They're the, the ones with a soft top that if you're gonna crash down that you're not going to take your teeth out um, and they're height adjustable. So a therapy bench can last you for quite a long time. You can kneel at it when it's high and then put it lower for sitting on. You can straddle, sit over them. So therapy benches are really quite useful piece of equipment and not mildly expensive. Um, you can probably get a decent therapy bench for about £200. Okay. Um, I really want my child aged 13 who has just started to be martyred to have an achievable goal and I thought self-transferring was a possibility. What exercises would you recommend to reach this goal? Well, I think that there's a lot of things you have to think about. And my honest feeling is self-transferring, um, if you are looking at self-transferring, you're probably talking about sliding board. And if you're talking about sliding board, then you're talking about weight bearing through arms. Now, the question then is, are your elbows contracted? Do you have shoulder power? Is this what you're going to be looking at? And I would be working really hard on looking at the, the use of a sliding board. And there's a lot of pre-work you can do. There's a lot of sitting, trying to shift yourself up the bed, trying to swivel yourself around, trying to play games where you're landing on one hand to be able to take the weight because once you've used the sliding board you have to be able to then reach and push yourself across so what you may want to do is um, speak to an OT or a physio about how, how you would manage trying a sliding board what would be involved and what the goals are and break it up into little pieces so what you need to look at is 
exactly what is entailed in a sliding board, what muscles you need, what movements you need, and work on each one as an almost individual thing and then build it all back up together to slide. But if you want to do independent transfers, it sounds like a really good place to start is the sliding board. Okay. Um, is a horse riding mechanical simulator using SMA with a positive impact in spine um, stabilization or can it be negative? Child who gets swim rather, five years old type two, um, and at what degree of scoliosis should it not be used? Okay, I mean, one of the problems that we have is that if you are on one of these wobbly things, it's great for core, it's great for your spine. My honest feeling is it shouldn't be increasing scoliosis because it will depend. You're not actually sort of going to one side or the other. It's very much a backwards and forwards movement. So it's quite symmetrical in that respect. There's no reason why you should be twisting or bending to the side. It's very much a forwards backwards movement. The most important thing to think about is are you sitting on it symmetrically? Is your pelvis as level as it can be? Now, if it's not, then you have to think about how you can make that pelvis as level as possible on that piece of equipment. Do you need to wedge one side? Do you need to use some sort of cushion on top of it to try and get the child symmetrical? So that if they're sitting skew with when you put them on, then of course they're going to end up doing all the work very much over to one side. If you can keep in the middle, then you are working better. So you need to try and make sure that your weight bearing on that machine is symmetrical as possible to start with. And that's where those machines need to be used. If you're sitting to the side, then you're only gonna make things worse. You really need to be plonk in the middle as straight as possible. Doesn't matter if your spine's tipped a bit, but as long as your pelvis is as level as possible, because that's where the work is coming all through the core, not so much through the trunk and not the top of the spine. It's a core exercise, but you need a level pelvis. Okay. And does having spinal rod surgery stop you from doing hydrotherapy? Not at all but you will need to get your surgeon's permission. Some surgeons say six months, certain surgeons say a year. So you need to check with your surgeon because it's very, very individual, but absolutely not. There's whether it's, if you've got complete fusion, then there shouldn't be an issue at all. Magic rods, you will have to speak to your surgeon, but certainly there is no issue with going in a pool post-spinal surgery. I know a lot of people are worried about it, um, we had a young man who was absolutely petrified about going into the pool and had spinal surgery, came to us at Great Ormond Street because he wasn't happy to go locally. We had three physios in the pool for him um, and one on the outside. And his comment to me was, what will it feel like? To which I replied, as he expected, wet. Um, People have this funny feeling that somehow when you get into the water, either you'll go rusty or you'll seize up or something will happen. Um, it's, it's, it's different, you know, it's not as easy to move around, but it's a very, very positive thing to keep doing after spinal surgery. Um, when you have an operation to unfix fixed feet? Yes. But the question is why and at what age? And um, are you an anaesthetic risk? That's something you have to think about. What do you want your feet done for? And again, it's back to this. Is it a soft tissue job where you would have to wear splints? And if you're an adult, you probably won't want to wear splints. If you're a child, is bony surgery an option because it stops your feet growing? Do you want tiny feet? girls do maybe boys don't um but certainly foot surgery is always possible it's not one of those things that even if you were in your 30s or 40s that would be impossible the question would be why but more important than why is are you an anesthetic risk and is this something you want to do so more important than getting your feet straight any orthopedic surgeon will be able to get your feet straight but you need to get through the operation 
Um, any recommendations for exercises to improve sit to stand transfer? Oh, difficult one. Um, that is hard work, sit to stand transfer. Um, I think if I was going to, it depends whether it's an adult or a child and also what type. If you are a fairly mobile person who can get onto a therapy ball, a therapy ball is a great way for doing sit to stand, but you have to be fairly active to start with for a therapy ball to be useful. If you have a raising, lowering seat on your wheelchair, of course, that's a bit of a cheat. So that is the best way to get from sitting to standing. Um, my honest feeling is get a sit to stand wheelchair. If you can't do that, what you need to do is graduate. You need to be sitting fairly high and practice. There's no point in sitting from something low and getting to standing. So you need to be, I mean, one of the things that we do uh, in the physio department is we have a, obviously a bed that goes up. Now, a lot of the electric beds do go higher. What you need to do is set it as high as possible and practice from almost standing and then go lower and lower and lower so that you're graduating. So you're starting off pretty high and you're going down and down and down. So this is how I would do sit to stand. Okay. Um, I'm experiencing the upper back and shoulder pain that you mentioned. Is that pain caused by trying to sit or stand upright or by holding up a heavy head or both? It's very much related to holding up a heavy ho head more than sitting upright because sitting upright should actually relax your shoulders down if you're doing it properly. Uh, basically, this is the holding the heavy head. This is the sitting upright. The sitting upright should relax those trapezius muscles. It's more the heavy head that's causing the problem. You can do exercise for it. We like particularly PNF style exercises to try and strengthen the neck muscles stop overworking the trapezius muscle but that pain um is definitely lifting that heavy head or or more asymmetrically or just resting on one arm can also give you shoulder pain across the side of the shoulder of the arm that you're always propping your chin up on yeah i notice when i get it because i get it down here and it goes to about here in my arm yeah. And it also goes up into my head as well and gives me a migraine. Yeah, well, the trapezius muscle actually attaches to the base of your skull. Yeah, I sometimes have to massage right up into my hairline to do it. Yeah, okay. I am 43, strong type 2. Used capo till about age of 14. Could stand on my knees until around 35 with help. I am on Ristaplan since September. When is it worth to retry a capo? Well, that depends on how contracted you've got and whether you want to do it. If you haven't got contracted, there's three things you need to think about. If you're not contracted, who's going to arrange them for you, where you're going to go to get them and who's going to help you use them. So in other words, have you got somebody who will refer you, an adult neurologist or your GP? Have you got a good orthotic department within adults? Because actually, most decent orthotic companies are paediatric, not adult. And the other thing is, once you get them, do you have a physio or somebody who can work with you to make sure that you can use them effectively? So there are several things you need to think about. Um, if you're in the UK and you want some help with that, PM me. Okay. So I'm just having a bit of an issue with questions. People are sending me them through because my phone has stopped showing them. Um, have you ever heard of a Nuga Best N5? It's a massage bed with a massage protector and projector and heat. Would that be safe for an SMA child? I wouldn't use anything with heat for a child. Um, I think you're really um on shaky ground when you're using heat with a child the other thing is i'm not sure that massage if you're going to massage with a child i'd want to put my hands on 
I'm not sure I'd want to use a machine at all with a child. If you're talking massage and children, my honest feeling is you need to be feeling what you're doing. You need to be able to vary what you're doing to work with the child. Um, my honest feeling is personally, if I am thinking about massage for a child, this is a hands-on job. This is not a machine job. Machines are great for adults, but I wouldn't use anything for children. child and certainly nothing that um, included heat. I'm just, sorry, I'm just checking. I have got all of them. <laughs> Technology is great when it works, isn't it? Um, I'm just wondering, this is a question from me personally while people send me things through. So you mentioned about passive movement. Is passive movement sometimes good to keep the joints moving and flexible whilst you're building the strength back up? To yes, the undoubtedly this is true, um, that passive will help to maintain range that you can't move yourself. And for that reason, this is why hydrotherapy, swimming, even things like the inner walk can keep you going until you build up some power. The question is what your goal is. Um, well, if you're happy that your child or yourself is on the inner walk and you are be putting, being passively moved, it can help your circulation, it can help with um, even things like constipation, with urine, with bone health, that's absolutely fine. But don't think that necessarily it will make you walk if you don't have the power. And this is what we're talking about. It's not whether the machines are doing you good or harm, it's realistic expectations for what you're gonna get out of them. But certainly passive movement will maintain range that you can't do yourself. What we're saying is that you're not gonna learn, your muscles will not learn pass from passive movement. It will maintain joint ranges. It can have a lot of positive effects, but it doesn't teach muscle. And that's what you need to remember. There's lots of positive effects of passive, but it doesn't teach muscles to be stronger. Okay. And the vibration plates um, that you went on about earlier, um, are they, is there any use in using them whilst you're in your wheelchair to put your feet on them? I don't know, because I don't think there's any research being done on a non-ambulant use of vibrating plates. Um, my honest feeling is that you should give them a go and see whether you feel that there's any benefit. Don't just stick your feet on and vibrate. You may as well get a massage machine. If all you're doing is using them to basically vibrate or improve your circulation, I think you've got the wrong sort of machine and you could do better. But if you want to use them to see if it can improve your exercise, then give it a go. The other thing, of course, being is just because you're non-ambulant doesn't mean to say you can't find some way of sitting on it and maybe using it to help your core, strengthen your middle and do other work on it. The other thing is um, whether you can, um, like the young lady who wants to do transfers, whether by using the vibrating plate will help stimulate anything higher up because one of the things about doing um transfers is if you can do it with your feet on the floor obviously it gives you a more stable base so whether by putting your feet on something like that could actually help with stabilizing your legs and getting your legs flat on the floor i have no idea i think there's very very little research being done on vibrating plates in the non-ambulant and it may well be that some of the adult physios may, we may need to get some help from the adult physios and see what they say. Okay. Um, I have one question, one second. What is your recommendation? How many minutes, hours of therapy exercise do you recommend every day or week? There are so many things to work on how do you make sure you are not losing focus? My son is 16 years old, type three. Okay, the recommended daily exercise is an hour of aerobic exercise a day. Now, not everybody can fit an hour in. You can't always do an hour of exercise if you're at school, if you're 16, if you've got GCSEs, if you've got A-levels. Many 
young adults of that sort of teenage age cannot fit all their schoolwork and an hour a day of exercise. But this is where we say that activity is exercise. You don't have to be doing an hour of continuous exercise. You could do quarter of an hour of arm exercise in the morning. You could do something in standing in the afternoon. You could do something later in the evening rather than just sitting on your butt watching the wheelchair. Uh, watching the television or playing on your Xbox, you could be doing exercise while you're doing it. Uh, the biggest problem we have with lockdown is the lack of things like hydrotherapy, lack of horse riding. Although I know some of the horse riding centers are open because it's one of those activities that you can do outside in the fresh air and pretty much socially distance. But um, it's really hard to find positive activities. The motivation again goes back to goals and what you want to achieve or what you want to maintain, what you enjoy doing. I think the most important thing about motivation to exercise is enjoying it. And if you can find an activity you enjoy, if you want to do some arm exercise, you've got an indoor basketball net or some way of doing something that you actually enjoy doing. Try not to make it repetitive, that you're not doing the same thing every day, that you vary it, but sometimes you do more of the arms, sometimes you do more of the legs, sometimes you get out of your wheelchair, you roll around on the bed and do a load of art, you know, body type stuff, even rolling, turn on your front and do a bit of press ups and head work, you can just stick some Pilates and yoga in there if that's your thing, you know, vary it, uh, but an hour is not an incredible amount of time of day if you split it up into different parts but it's an hour an hour if you try and do it all in one go when you're trying to do all your schoolwork and get on your xbox and you're there on facebook or twitter or any of the other social media with your mates or you're on xbox with your mates or whatever an hour does seem quite a long time so split it up make it enjoyable add lots of different activities in there um, you know, when you've got a teenager, let them direct the exercise, let them say what they want to do, where they're motivated, what is positive for them and what their goals are. And is it, could it be one of those where you do a little bit more on a weekend if you've got a bit more time? It can be, but I always worry about overdoing it at the weekends, not that anybody really ever overdoes it at the weekends. Um, it's not one of those things that you do, but I'd rather you did little and often and spread it out than try to push it all onto the weekends and, and maybe overdo it at the weekends. But yeah, you can, but if you do little and often during the week, just to do Saturday, Sunday, and then leave the rest of the week doesn't really give you any carryover. You're almost starting again every Saturday and Sunday. You need to keep it going on a gentle level through the week. You mentioned the little cycle machines that could be used with hands and feet. If you're finding that your feet feel really unstable in them, could it be that you might need something like an AFO to wear with the machine to stabilise your ankle? Well, it may be. It depends what you mean by unstable in your feet. Do your feet feel unstable or do you just feel as though you're going to fall off the pedals because they're not the same thing? Um, I would say that you could use an AFO, you could use something called a SMAFO. Now, the difference between a SMAFO and an AFO is a SMAFO actually allows you a little bit of up and down movement, which an AFO doesn't. So it may be that a SMAFO, which will stop the rolling of your ankle and heel in and out, but allow you a little bit of up and down movement. So a SMAFO may be better than an AFO if it's ankle instability rather than you foot falling off the pedal. The other thing that we use, um, and again may allow you some stability and mobility, are the tri-lock splints that we've mentioned before on the webinars. A smuffle is almost a bit like you see a lot of basketball players wearing them when they've had an ankle injury before. A little bit like that, but they're plastic, so they're a bit harder than those. They're actually um, almost like a short AFO. They don't come up very high, but they have this strange little cutout at the back that gives room for the uh, tendon and the foot to actually move up and down. 
So it allows the up and down movement, but not like the twisty movement. Is that right? Yeah. I haven't I haven't got my bag of oh hang on. I might I've got my bag of tricks here. Let's see if I've got a smaffo in my bag of tricks. What have I got in here? I've definitely got an AFO. Have I got a smaffo? Where's my smaffo? Ah. Oh got one here we go this is a smaffo um it's quite short as you can see got plenty of straps on but it's got this part at the back that's open and that allows the foot to go up and down your left a little bit because it's out of camera that's it so that's a smaffo um so it's quite enclosing so it's to control the heel and the hind foot more than the ankle and allows the ankle to move up and down. So a smaffo, but it is plastic and it is molded individually. It's got lots of straps on, the straps at the front. Um, I'm not sure where that one came from. That looks like a spare. Oh, that's interesting. Oh no, that's just an extra piece of Velcro. That's not a strap. So yes, a smaffo may be a better thing than an AFO. Okay, and when you're using these hand cycles for your arm, is it important to have your elbows almost suspended so you are working it from the shoulder and not just from your elbow? I think that that's two different exercises. So one is just sort of working from the elbows and one is more working from the shoulders. And again, it's two different exercises. If you've got your hands, it's actually quite difficult to do it with your forearms suspended, but if you, let go you should be able to use your shoulders and your elbows together but it's actually i think it must be quite difficult to have your forearms i was just thinking for people who might need that to be able to balance is it still worth them doing it oh absolutely absolutely just do it and um, because you're going to improve you can't avoid your shoulders doing exercise and even when you're doing that because they're helping to stabilize your arms while you're turning an inf. In fact, if you stick your elbows down and do that, you can feel the front of this muscle working. Okay, well, I think that's it for questions, but just we put a little question out saying what countries have we re reached tonight? So we have reached Greece, North Macedonia, uh, Lebanon, the States and Canada, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, just to, give a shout out, we've got a couple of Facebook groups. So we've got the one for the community, which is physio and exercise ideas. And Marion is almost, is also an admin of that group. And then we've also got one that it, well, it was Marion who suggested we set it up, which is for professionals. And I don't know if you want to explain that a little bit, Marion. Well, basically, the professionals group is so that the professionals can share ideas without parents jumping in and sort of saying, oh, will that work for me? Will that work for you? Because there are times when parents want to sort of be away from their professionals, get ideas from other people. But there's also times when professionals want to get together and try out ideas on each other without parents thinking that it's relevant to their child and their thing so there is a professionals group it's for all therapists speech physio ot's um from around the world please if you're thinking of joining can you fill in all the questions if you're a professional you won't be allowed into the community group and if you are a parent or somebody with sma you won't be allowed into the um professionals group so it's one or the other parents i'm afraid um, if you're a physio who's also a parent, you may want to split yourself up, but generally the groups have two different values and so are separate. Yeah, and if you are a parent, you might want to, and you've got a physio or a therapist, you might want to suggest they check out the professionals group as well. Um, so you can always forward the link on. Yeah. The other thing, Marnie, is we need more ideas. I am running out of ideas for uh, topics, 
uh, if people say they've had enough, that's fine. If there's no more topics, we've been through everything and we're finished, that's okay. But if people have more topics and they want to continue, just let us know what you want to hear. Whether we go over something we've been over before, whether we change it, whether there's something we seem to have missed, just let us know. Yeah, we will set a poll up in the Treat SMA Facebook group. So if you're not part, of the Treat SMA Facebook group, please do request to join and fill in the questions. Um, and we'll set up a poll in there for people to put suggestions into. Okay. Well, thank you, Marion. It's another fantastic, really informative webinar. I'm sure people thank have you. been helpful. Lots and hopefully if we find a topic, we will see you in two weeks. Yep, yeah, definitely. So make sure you put Lovely. your suggestions in. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Barney. Take care. Bye. Bye.